My next guest has a stunning story to tell about our government's involvement with UFOs, extraterrestrials, secret moon bases, and yes, human trafficking, one of the most lucrative businesses in the world, all tied together. It might be uncomfortable for some of you to watch what we're about to discuss, but I want you to watch this with an open mind. We now have more whistleblowers who've come forward to confirm the stories that you're about to hear. They're supporting evidence and documents and testimony. Uh, Niara Isley served in the United States Air Force and was stationed at Nellis Air Force Base. Her specialty at the time was auto track radar, which was designed to lock onto and track surface to air missiles and anti aircraft artillery using precision laser technology. One of her jobs was to track a government made UFO that was built using alien technology. And that's just the beginning of the story. Niara joins us now. Welcome to Redacted. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you. Um, one little correction to your intro. Um, I was actually tracking aircraft, you know, like jet aircraft. That okay. was my job to track the aircraft. And we had surface air missile uh, sites that we were radar sites that we worked at. So basically, we were tracking the aircraft with a very tiny targeting beam. And then what we did was we trained pilots to fly against radar and use countermeasures to break radar locks on them so they would have a greater survivability and not get shot out of the sky. So that's basically my job. I was training pilots to fly and cope with targeting radar and break their radar locks so that they could escape. And then out in the, and then there was that, that time I was, multiple times I think, um, taken out in the middle of the night to track, uh, to see if we could target track uh, these uh, special aircraft that turned out to be either alien spacecraft or back engineered or a combination of both. Which is unbelievable. So that's that's a major piece of this. And, and I guess we'll start at the beginning. So you were working in the United States Air Force. And did you have some experience before this or was that the beginning of this where you worked at the United States Air Force? You were involved in this radar tracking technology. You were training pilots how to break this so they could survive and not mm -hmm. be shot down. And mm -hmm. then what was the moment that changed your life forever? Did it happen there at the Air Force or did it happen before that? Um, it, it really happened there. I mean, I did have childhood uh, uh, ET abductions, alien abductions, if you want to call it that. Um, and that was disturbing enough. And that's a whole different story. But um, today we're going to focus on, on these things that happened to me in the military. And... Uh, it, I should start by saying that what happened to me was so traumatic I didn't remember it for nine years. And uh, it's, there's, there's something that happens in the subconscious when something that happens to you is so traumatic that it would cause you probably to want to end your life uh, rather than live with the fallout of it. Um, the subconscious says, okay, that's really too much for her to handle. We're going to tuck that away in the deep subconscious. And uh, so she doesn't remember it. So for nine years, I didn't remember it. But I had PTSD very bad. I didn't realize it at the time that it was PTSD. Um, I just knew I had intense anxiety and a lot of emotional mood swings and rages and all kinds of things. Um, and I couldn't explain why they were there. And so uh, nine years went by, then a friend of mine uh, talked, sat me down one day and he says, I know you were in the military, right? Yeah, I was. Can you tell me about it? You know, he says, because you never talk about it, you know? And I said, well, there's not a lot to tell. So well, just tell me about it from start to finish chronologically. So I did. And long story short, when we got to my first duty station uh, at, up at the Tonopah, uh, the town of Tonopah and then the Tonopah Electronic Combat Range. Um, I couldn't remember anything. And I got really scared. I felt a wave of nausea come over me. I couldn't remember three months of my life, basically. And uh, so I started, uh, excuse me, sometimes the story gets to me. Um, I imagine. Well, I can't imagine. So. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, later that year, I went to the Whole Life Expo in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I ran into Bud Hopkins, who uh, old timers in the UFO field know. He was one of the first guys 
out there to do a lot of hypnosis work with alien abductees. Right. And I, I attended his talk. I raised my hand. And I said, well, I have this strange stuff from childhood and I have three months of missing time from when I was in the, in the Air Force. And he said, talk to me afterwards. Uh, again, uh, he did a hypnosis session on me that evening. And some of this story came tumbling out. And then later on, I had more hypnosis and, and got a fuller picture of what had happened. And it explained everything. It explained my anxiety, explained PTSD symptoms. Um, it explained this thing after I separated from the military and was working with an all-male crew in a government contract situation. I was having uh, I was having really severe heart palpitations, and it would feel like somebody was strangling me at the same time. And I couldn't figure that out, but it was it was really a nasty attack to have, you know. And it would happen just happen periodically, and uh, I finally learned to control it uh, with pranayama you know, breathing exercises, uh, yogic types, and managed to get it to go away. But it has resurfaced in the last few years, uh, just a little bit here and there. But um, the memory of that, that was actually hooked to an actual memory that, that surfaced in 2017, where I finally remembered that I was being sexually assaulted and strangled and smothered at the same time mm. until I lost consciousness. By members of the military. And I don't think it was regular military. I think this was kind of um, government contractors. Um, and the guy that uh, was doing it was definitely like a psychopath, you know, like a sociopath who enjoyed inflicting trauma and torture on people. And I, I have this idea in my head that they probably fished him out of a prison and put him to, get, to, put him to work in our government in these shadowy deep projects. How did you come and to meet so these individuals? You were you were in the Air Force, but this so the mm -hmm. start of this three month period, what what did you uncover in this hypnosis? What was the what was the catalyst? Uh, well, um, I was uh, I was going up to Tonopah, the town of Tonopah, they, they had us put up in, in hotel rooms there. And then we'd we'd be bussed out to the range to do our jobs, you know, the, which is basically tra training pilots to fly against radar. So you'd be training and, pilots uh, to fly against radar out on out on the job on out on the out on the range, and that's why you were there. Yeah, okay. that was that was the daytime job. Um, but this, what happened to me was in the middle of the night. Um, somebody came into my hotel room, and they had a key to get in because there was not a bunch of noise being made. They just let themselves in and uh woke me up i'm you know very startled and they had guns and they gave me fatigues to wear with no rank insignia no name tags no identifying marks uh took took me out and put me into this suburban type of vehicle uh like a chevy suburban painted you know blue air force blue and uh we drove out to the uh the Tonopah test range and we went out to uh, a radar site out there, and there was two other guys out there with me, not females, but, but guy, men, and young men. And uh, we were in the radar van. Uh, they would call up coordinates of the aircraft in the sky, and we would try to see if we could get a lock on it. We basically could find it uh, by looking at the coordinates we were given. But as soon as we got a radar lock on it, it would literally just disappear off the scope. And this happened a few times. We just couldn't track these things. They were just, I, I said, I don't know what this is out there, but it can't be tracked. <laughs> and did they and, know what uh, they were? Do they want to see if you were able to track that, it? Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. They wanted to see if these things could be tracked. And they couldn't by the, be. By the um, best of the best, right? So presumably they're testing. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, this is conjecture, yeah. right? But it seemed like they're testing these craft. And they're bringing mm -hmm. out the best of the best, you, mm -hmm. to, to, to track it and see if they could find it. Well, think about, it. think about it this way. If they can't be tracked and they're armed with various types of weapons, you know, directed energy weapons or lasers or anything else like that, and they can't be tracked, then they can do a lot of damage because no tracking radar can keep a lock on them. You know? Right, right. So... I mean, uh, United States of America and the people of Earth, they're poster childs for why aliens should not ever give advanced technology to humans. 
because we're not spiritually evolved enough. All we can think of is to take the technology and weaponize it and use it for power and control. And that's exactly the kinds of stuff that our government has been doing with the, with the uh, alien technology they've captured or been given. And uh, what were you told uh, uh, when you said, I, I can't track these, I don't know what this is. What did you, and what, by the way, what year was this when you were, you were witnessing 1980, this? 1980. January of, 19, January of 1980. Wow. And uh, uh, we didn't do much talking. Um, again, at gunpoint, we were threatened not to talk to each other, me and the other two guys on the crew. We were threatened not to talk to each other beyond what was necessary to run the, the radar test. And uh, we weren't to talk, we weren't to compare notes, we weren't to discuss what we were seeing or what, what was going on. We were to stay absolutely quiet. And so when the test was over, um, some, I guess, higher ranking people or, or some people stayed in the radar van to discuss the results that we had had of the test. Excuse me. And we, me and the two guys were standing out on the deck of the radar van looking up in the night sky, not talking to each other. We were too scared to do that. Um, looking up there and there was craft in the sky. There was a certain number of craft. Um, I would say anywhere from 10 to 15 maybe. Uh, maybe not quite as many as 15. But the reason I'm I'm doubtful is because I was riveted, my attention was riveted on the one that was closest. And it was a big saucer shaped craft. It was floating out just beyond the, uh, the radar antenna that sat uh, a ways away from the, the, the radar van. And it was glowing orange on the bottom. And the sound coming from it was like speakers, the sound you get from speakers at a rock concert when the, the speakers are on, but no music is playing through. Like a hum. It was kind of this deep, a deep hum that vibrated through your body and made the hair stand up on the back of your neck. And, and I saw this and I thought, shit, I don't have high, high enough security clearance to be seeing this. And it scares the shit out of me that I'm seeing this. It scares the crap out of me. And I was right to be scared because um, when those guys were done talking in the radar van, they came out. They put us on a bus with painted over windows and took us to what I think was Area 51 and to some kind of medical facility. And they put us in a waiting room with several other people. I guess they'd had some other radar crews out that night to try and do this. And we were all sitting there, nobody talking to anybody, too scared to talk to anybody. And one by one, they called us off into this little side room. It was my turn. I went in the little side room. Uh, there was a an armed security guard there in uh, like desert camo fatigues. I don't think he was military. I think he was a government contractor. Um, Why do you say that? And because regular military shouldn't be acting this way. Regular military have a code of conduct that they're supposed to abide by. Hmm. And you know, if somebody is following orders to do something like this, that's in the military, if it if those orders violate their conscience, um, they're not supposed to follow them. Hmm. I just don't think that they could tell regular military to do the things that were being done out there and have them get done. Um, I think they had to have special government contract people that were getting really well paid to do what they were do. That's what I I strongly feel about off the books and, and this uh, and this this comports with yeah. other testimony eyewitness testimony that we've heard from others uh, this is very very similar that they felt like these individuals yeah. were government contractors off the books uh members mm -hmm. of the, not members of the military yeah i mean if, if somebody told me to go out there and, and stand guard and threaten somebody with guns about this i would have said what the hell what are you asking me to do right you know I don't think that they, they would even expose regular military to doing any kind of scenario like that because they would ask too many questions and they'd become a liability. Government contractors, they can brief them ahead of time. They know exactly what they're going to be doing and what they're doing and why. And they, and they do it and they're well paid to do it, I'm sure. Really well paid. So anyway, I laid on the stainless steel examining table as I was ordered to do. This guy stood in the room with me uh, with the sidearm uh, against the wall at, at the foot of the table I was laying on. 
And the equipment looked really old, looked like it was maybe from the 40s and 50s. Um, just old type, old military types of stuff like, you know, you wouldn't expect it, not new stuff. And uh, then some guy in a white lab coat came in the same door I had come through, walked past the security guard at the foot of the table, walked up beside the right side of my head, staying stay calm in a dead, dead tone, dead monotone voice and said, and when he got up beside the right side of my neck, he came up with one smooth move and he had a hypodermic needle hidden in the sleeve of his lab coat and he injected me in the side of the neck and whatever the chemical was went straight to the brain. And, uh, and I went immediately into shock and suddenly there's two security guards on either side of me pulling me up by my arms and taking me out this other door and outside the other door was uh, a very long staircase down and he, they drug me down the stairs. I'm like half walking, half being dragged. At the bottom of the stairs, there was like this little room or booth and they shoved me in there, shut the door, locked it. And I had just enough cognitive ability to notice that there was like a, there was like a big window looking thing, but on my side it was mirror. And I thought, man, they're looking at me go through this in a one-way glass. So I went through the effects of that injection, pretty much curled up on the floor screaming because mm. I didn't know what was happening to me. Um, felt like my body might be coming apart at the molecular level. It was just terrifying. And the feeling was like when you get Novocaine at a dentist times a thousand in my whole body. When it starts to wear off and it, it gets all tingly. I was all over my body and extremely far more powerful than Novocaine. So, and I don't think what I was given was Novocaine at all. Um, so then when I finally was exhausted, I wasn't screaming anymore. I was laying on the floor. The security guards came in and uh, dragged me out of there. And then I was uh, sexually assaulted by the two security guards while eight people watched. And I think the people watching were uh, one of them actually was a gray ET. Um, I don't know why he was there, but he was there. And the other people, they obviously didn't really want to look at what they were looking at. And uh, I think they were there, again, like threatened uh, that if you talk about what you're working on out here with this technology, uh, this is going to happen to your wives and daughters. I think they were being threatened. So that, that was that was pretty much the worst of it. Um, there are other things that were really bad. There was one particular blonde security guard with just ice cold blue eyes. And, uh, and I guess he was the, the guy that you'd call my handler. I hate that term. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, and then there was over this three month time period where I couldn't remember anything. Um, I think I must have gone through this same scenario a few times during that three month time period. And then there was the time when they put me on a craft, they took me down to this big hangar and there was an ET craft, an extraterrestrial saucer shaped craft in it. And um, down there on the hangar floor, uh, this blonde security guard handed me this handful of silver looking garments. He says, put this on, you know, take your clothes off and put this on. So I had to do that right there in front of everybody walking around. And so I put these silver clothes on and they were, they must have been of extraterrestrial manufacturer or something because once I had them on, they fit themselves to my body. They seemed really loose and baggy. As soon as I had them on, it was like they, they fit, they just fit. And uh, like they almost had their own I don't know, memory or something, or their own way of fitting itself. And then I got on the craft. There were boots and gloves that, that came with that outfit. And I had the gloves in my hand, I had the boots on. I got on the craft and I was instructed to lay down on the floor for the trip that we were going on. And there were two other guys in there laying on the floor too. So basically, wherever we were going, we were being taken like cargo. You know, we didn't get to sit in a chair. We had to lay down on the floor like a piece of cargo. And we were taken to the, the moon. Um, and... Uh, does it... Does it... Does it say... I mean, it sounds amazing to just say that out loud. 
that we were taken to the moon yeah. at, at uh -huh. gunpoint. You were forced to do this. Yeah. You were forced well, to do this. Gun, I, there weren't guns at this point because, well, there were guns, but you know, we, we weren't being actively threatened. We just knew that if we didn't uh, do as we were told that we'd be in serious trouble and we could die. You know, and uh, sorry, um, but um, so we went there. I think the flight may have taken it's very disorienting traveling the way that craft travels because um, they don't they can travel really fast, you know, anti gravity. But, did you feel the effects of this? And, yeah, well, when the, when the craft took off. Um, there was a sense of gravity because I felt pressed into the floor as the craft accelerated to get out of orbit. And once out of orbit, it went into some kind of different kind of drive where it, uh, but I'll just say this, the trip to the moon didn't take very long. I'm, my guess is 20 minutes, but I can't really make that a sound guess because it, the travel itself was just very disorienting. Um, you know, it was probably a minutes, several minutes of, of faster than light travel or fast as light travel. I don't know. Um, again, it's just disorienting and, and I would probably have to do more hypnosis and try to look at it really closely to try to figure it out. And honestly, I'm not crazy about doing any more hypnosis at this point. Um, I, 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 remember, I remember enough bad stuff to last me for the rest of my life. I really don't want to retrieve any more bad memories but I have enough to make sense of what went on and I have enough that may cause me to research once I remembered stuff caused me to do 14 years of research into what the heck happened to me out there and how it could happen in the United States of America and in what social and political context and after 14 years of research I can tell you I know lots and you've written a I'm, book I'm on a this. little bit like it. I wrote a book on it yeah and uh, I wrote a book on it uh, divided into three parts. One is called The Experiences, part two is called Healing, The Journey to Within, and part three is called Awakening. And uh, because for me, this was kind of like a shamanic awakening, just go to go through this trauma and start processing through it, and then to kind of come out on the other side and think, wow, you know, the implications for higher consciousness in all of this are just amazing. And so I kind of took that and I've always been a spiritual person anyway. So this, you know, it kind of gave me a springboard into a whole new level of, of consciousness and looking at consciousness and looking at uh, the very fabric of what's been going on on this planet for hundreds and thousands of years when the people in control indoctrinate everybody else to be, to behave, to believe a certain way, to act a certain way. And everything else like that and, and, and pe when people are indoctrinated it's like a fish swimming in water trying to get them to question their indoctrination is like getting trying to get fish to question the water they're swimming in but um, but because of all the things i learned and my spiritual nature to begin with it's like i just saw through it all and i've tried 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 to educate people that we're the ones that have the power we just have to drop the indoctrination and the propaganda and start, we have to question the very nature of reality, and then we have to make the reality around us as we see it. And quantum science bears this out. The study right. of, of quantum bears out what I'm talking about, and I did a lot of research into that as well. Now, so there, anyway, that's it. Yeah, no, know, there's a and, couple of pieces of this I want to just kind of unpack before we have to let you go, and I want to be respectful yeah. of your time, which is, the human trafficking element of all of this, as I talked about at the beginning, we had some testimony that came forward. Michael Herrera, former U.S. Marine, um, came forward uh -huh. and admitted to these off-the-books uh, paramilitary, who knows who they were, um, as his group, his, uh, he, his U.S. Marine, um, six of them, stumbled across these guys who were using some sort of advanced aerial craft, um, an alien reverse-engineered craft, and it looked like that they were human trafficking, gathering humans yeah. together and placing them on board these craft, uh, which was an absolute stunning revelation. But of course, we've been following the human trafficking story here on our show, which again is a $154 billion a year industry, one of the biggest industries in the world. 
when you were taken to the yeah. moon base, when you were taken to the moon mm -hmm. base, what did you see there? And does this comport with some of this testimony on human trafficking using these advanced vehicles? Well, human trafficking is to be taken against your will and taken someplace and used in a way that you would not choose to be used. Most of the time used for sex and, uh, and slavery. that's what happened on. The, yeah, it's, it's, it's slavery. And, um, so during the day, um, during the day I worked at hard labor, you know, like moving things around and stacking boxes and, and just, you know, doing labor type activity. Um, I was, I was on like a bread and water diet and not much of it. And I wasn't allowed to sleep at night and at night, um, myself and several other girls that, that happened to be up there as well, were put in a big room with a bunch of guys. And I guess we were, we were to be the entertainment for the guys that lived and worked up there, sexual entertainment. So we got passed around from guy to guy. Uh, we had to comply. We had to, uh, we just had to deal with the situation the best way we could. Um, but looking back on those memories, it's, it's horrible. Um, it, it's, it's beyond horrible. Were you able to tell any of your military superiors about this or you didn't, you were so remember. traumatized that you didn't, you didn't know it until yeah. years later, until 2017. There's one of the, one of the books I happened to read, uh, gave me a clue to that. Um, what was it? It was about chaos theory. Um, I can't remember the title of it right now, but I wrote, I was reading about it and it talked about one of the, uh, one of the government contractors, uh, out at the Nevada test site, um, may have been Los Alamos national labs. I don't know which contractor it was, but they were doing experiments with, uh, chaos theory and the human brain and, and, and devising drugs to work with this. So, they probably gave me, I know they gave me another injection that put me to sleep um, when I was being transported back to my motel room in the middle of the night. And uh, whatever they did, it, it wiped my memory. And the other thing that, that really uh, triggered me was seeing the movie Paycheck and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, where they actually put somebody in a device and we're able to zap the neurons in the brain, isolating a particular block of memory so that you couldn't access it. So there's, I may have been put through something like that as well. And because uh, usually technology that you see in movies has already, already been well developed ahead of the time and they're just kind of putting it out there in a movie setting. Um, so anyway, when I get back from the moon, uh, the blonde security guard would put me through more trauma, more sexual trauma. And that included uh, being raped. And at the same time, he was raping me. He was strangling me and or smothering me. And uh, to this day, I can't sleep with my head on a pillow. I can't sleep on anything that's going to, you know, like a pillow comes up around your face a little bit and can touch your face. I can't handle it. I, I can't. Yeah, I just, uh, I can't have anything touching my face while I sleep. When you've gone through this hypnosis and then subsequently started doing massive amounts of research on this, mm -hmm. and you started corroborating through evidence and interviews and testimony, what did you find? Can you talk about some of that evidence and testimony from others? I'm curious if also the, the, the two other men who were out there on that test range with you that night for the very first time with at gunpoint, yeah. Have you ever spoken mm -hmm. to them since then? No, no, I never spoke with them again. Um, we had experience working on the same type of radar, but uh, my guess was they were chosen from a different radar site because they were not people that I knew. Uh, so um, there was one guy that I did see that I did know um, but I, I never talk about him because if he doesn't have memories back, he doesn't need me forcing him into, you know, 
memory recall or a situation by me saying his name. So that's going to forever be sealed. <laughs> so right. I'll never say it. it's it's really up to each individual if they retrieve these memories or not and what they do with it. So um, anyway, um, I was just I was just re traumatized. I think they either had a drug or this machine that could go in and isolate blocks of memory. But um, on a more spiritual uh, alternative healing level, all the memories of our lifetime are not just stored in the brain and the neurons and the physical hardware of the body. It's also stored in the energetic field of a, of a person. And so you can, you can do stuff to the, to the hardware up here, you know, like zap neurons and isolate blocks of memory. But <clears throat> it's always possible to build a new pathway, a new neurological pathway into that memory if you have something that reminds you of something else. Now, as far as going to the moon, if that's too fantastic for some of your audience to believe, um, then I would advise them to watch the Disclosure Project from 2001. There's videos of the Disclosure Project that was done by Stephen Greer in 2001 at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And he did another vid another long video called Witness uh, Disclosure Project Witness Testimony. That's actually the better one of the two to watch if you can find it on YouTube or Rumble or someplace. Because you're going to see a whole bunch of military people and some civilian personnel talking about their experiences with extraterrestrial technology. Uh, they're going to talk about um, threats that were made to them and their families if they ever talked. Um, and uh, some of them, uh, Thomas Wolfe, who was, uh, they finally got to him, he, he died in a very, on very un unusual circumstances. He was out on his bicycle and a semi sideswiped him and killed him. Um, as did this Pete, is long after. As did Pete Peterson yeah. as well. Yeah, Pete Peterson and other people. Anyway, um, there were people, Thomas Wolfe was one, and there were some other ones talked about uh, bases on the dark side of the moon or bases on the moon. And uh, in Thomas Wolfe's case, he talked about, um, he worked in photographic equipment and he, and he was gonna go supposedly fix some dark room equipment. And one of the airmen there showed him pictures of the moon and structures on the moon. And he said, it, he said at the time he saw that he was afraid to, that of what he was seeing. He didn't want to look at it anymore because he felt like his life was in danger because they really want to keep this stuff secret. And I heard in my research, I found that uh, it's possible about 600 people were done away with to keep uh, the Roswell crash a secret. And it raised a lot of eyebrows and questions. And I mean, 600 people going away, that's a lot. And that's a lot to try to cover up. And I think later on they learned that they can't just uh, make people go away. And one of the people that died was a real high profile guy. Uh, God, his name was right in my head. Um, Forrestal. Yeah, Secretary Forrestal. He wanted, he saw the extraterrestrial. He wanted to go public with it. And he felt really powerfully strongly that we should go public with it, that people deserved the right to know. And he was, uh, they ruled his death a suicide, but he was thrown out a uh, second floor, second or third floor window of the hospital. And one of the guys in the disclosure project said the fall didn't kill him, but he didn't get up alive. Hmm. And so, I mean, this is serious stuff. This is yeah. really serious. Beyond the threats that you've already, the trauma that you've already suffered and the mm -hmm. memory wiping that may have occurred and you were laying there and you, what you saw was an extraterrestrial um, at yeah. per, perhaps S4 at Area 51 working in tandem with human beings. Um, did you yeah. see other extraterrestrials when yeah. you were on the moon base as well? Uh, it's a long crush. I do want to say one thing about the extraterrestrial at Area 51. That's corroborated by another whistleblower uh, who has passed away. His name was Bill Uhouse. He said there was an extraterrestrial there working at the uh, Area 51 base. Um, and he was like a technical advisor while they were working to back engineer the craft. 
And so they so were working you, in you tandem. They were working in tandem yeah. with, yes, our government right. to reverse engineer these craft under some sort of agreement. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, I mean, it's just, it's really, it's a horny, thorny thing. You know, it's people that have the money, like oil cartels, you know, they have the money to buy into these kinds of secret projects and information and know what's going on. One of the reasons we haven't come out with zero point energy and used it to change the lives of everybody on this planet for the better and get away, get away from fossil fuels is because it would destroy the oil company uh, hold that it has on the, the economy of the planet. Okay. These are really powerful people. They don't want their, their little oil empire destroyed. Well, and also the healthcare industry would not want right. the, the, the tools that are available through whistleblowers who've mm -hmm. spoken about the yeah. incredible healing technology that exists as well, that if that right. were to come out, um, would destroy yeah. the biopharmaceutical complex. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's a, here's an interesting question. Okay. Why would a bunch of power, a, a small group, compar comparatively speaking, a small group of really powerful globalists be watching, be surveilling us so closely and watching every move we make and, and indoctrinating us and propagandizing us and everything else like that. Why would they do all this stuff to humanity if they weren't really afraid of something? I think this is the consciousness thing again. If we ever come together in a unified consciousness and we throw off the indoctrination and we throw off the propaganda and all the the mind trips that have been played on us all these years we could change the face of this planet and there's not another thing there's not a thing they could do about it and we could do it unified through the quantum field because when more people went like when a group of people meditate to bring down the crime level in a particular city uh -huh. the crime level does drop yeah it's been proven it's proven. scientifically quantified so if we had just masses and masses of humanity wake up and start dropping their indoctrination and start envisioning envisioning the kind of reality that we want to live in um then the whole human experiment has has left the globalists hands and it's sadly. out of their hands at that you know so yeah. it's it's we that have the keys to the castle we just have to wake up and realize it and sadly, it seems like we're going, we've been going in the opposite direction in the past few yeah. years with the violence and the crime um, and a moving away from a higher level of consciousness, which is really, really, yeah. really sad. Um, and at the same time, well, masses and massive people are waking up. So it's kind of, you know, one, there's the side that you're just talking about, but there's also a side where I'm just seeing people waking up in droves, realizing right. just how much they've been lying lives well we have so many people i mean we just passed you know a couple million subscribers here on this channel who are seeking the truth and to read yeah. the comments on a video like this you know you'll get the people who just can't believe it you'll get the people who believe uh -huh. that that they they just they it, it's blowing their worldview out of the water and they just cannot wrap their heads around it and so they'll say something yeah. i don't know they'll say uh -huh. something negative but then there's going to be thousands of comments of people who are going to be touched by this interview and they're going to, this may have sparked something in them to go deeper, to start questioning things, to start doing the research, to start reading the literature, to start, I mean, you're not alone. And there are thousands okay. of individuals like you now, and there's more coming out about this. Whistleblowers, yeah. are you encouraged by, like we saw Dr. Greer's Disclosure Project, the most recent one two weeks ago, where you're hearing now more and more whistleblowers People who worked at Raytheon are coming forward and telling what's going on. People who work in the government, mm -hmm. members of the military, they're coming forward and they're telling the truth about what they experienced. I still have to find time to sit down and watch that. I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> Oddly it's, enough, yeah, I just, I have to go offline that, you know, I can't be riveted on devices 24 seven, but, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching it, but I am very gratified by all the whistleblowers coming forward. Um, I think it's really going to change how the game is played on this planet. And I look forward to seeing that. Mostly my hope today is in all the people waking up on this planet. That's where my hopes lie. Because if enough of us wake up and realize just the, the absolute depth 
of which we've been lied to for millennia, for, for all the decades that each individual watching this has been alive, they realize just how much they've been lied to. It's like we have this thing called the National Security Act of 1947, which was put in, signed into law just a few short months after the Roswell crash. And um, it created all these alphabet agencies, the FBI, the CIA, and it, you know all those things, okay? But the National Security Act of 1947 ostensibly was to protect the security of the United States of America. What it actually did, this really irritates me, um, it, what it actually did was it created an impenetrable curtain of secrecy around all these projects like mind control projects, human trafficking projects, um, extraterrestrial technology being developed behind closed doors where it can't ever benefit the people of the earth that it, it should benefit. Um, they created this impenetrable wall of secrecy. And if somebody tried to bring a court case to court about, the, about how the secrecy had affected their lives and destroyed their lives, then they invoke the National Security Act of 1947 and the whole case gets thrown out of court for reasons of national security. So the National Security Act of 1947 was never about the security of the United States of America and its people. It was about creating the impenetrable, impenetrable shield of secrecy behind which criminals can continue to get away with criminal behavior all the way up to murder and adrenochrome and human trafficking and every other kind of nasty freaking thing you can imagine. Okay, that's what the National Security Act is going to do. If I was ever president of, of, of the United States of America, I would abolish the National Security Act of 1947 and lay all that sh stuff out in the open. Hallelujah. So people could learn and make up yeah. their own mind. But Absolutely. Anyway, I'm pretty passionate about this, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... You know? Well, that's why I do this show. I mean, the, the name of our show is Redacted because of all of the things that are held back from the American people and from, you know, from all of us. Yeah. It's being held and hidden in dark rooms. Um, well, I took an oath to this country. I took an oath to this country and its people. And I took that oath to heart. And my book is less about being, it's about UFOs and my own experiences and, and stuff around that subject. But it's also the book of a patriot who was raised by her father to be a patriot of this country. And that book is the best service I ever did to my country. Niara, can you tell us the name of the book so people can go read it and learn more about this story? Yeah, uh, the name of the book is called Facing the Shadow, Embracing the Light, A Journey of Spirit Retrieval and Awakening. And it is on Amazon. And I, I'm very sorry I've recently had to raise the price of it, otherwise lose any royalties at all to get from it. No, so, I know the, the game on I Amazon is, the, Yeah. I still need to get a little trickle of royalties coming in. It, it, it helps me out. So um, anyway, yeah, the book is still there, Facing the Shadow, Embracing the Light. Just look up Niara Isley book and you'll find it. Well, we'll link it up in the description, and I want everyone to go and read the book and with an open mind and hear Niara's story. And uh, I'd love to have you come back on the show. We can dive more deeply into some sure. of these topics specifically. I wanted yeah. to have you on to kind of introduce you to our audience here, and then I would love to dive more deeply into discussions about the moon base. I'd love to talk more uh, about these secret government programs and these technologies that are being kept kept from us and higher consciousness sure. as well. Niara, thank you so sure. much for joining us here on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for your time um, and your honesty and your transparency. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Okay. Take good care. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.